one part tough as nails off-road workhorse, the other a 585 horsepower 22 inch wheel fire breathing show off. This iconic truck has defied common sense and automotive trends for the better part of 40 years. It has conquered deserts, mountains, racetracks, and Moscow rush hour traffic. Edging its bank fall shaped into the hearts of millions of fans around the world. In the words of James Pumphrey, this four part series is very literally everything you need to know to get up to speed on the Mercedes G Wagon. Now, those of you who have been following this channel know that for the past year, Lasse and I have been restoring a 1988 Mercedes G Wagon in what we have dubbed Project Thor. Today, one year ago, we were up there in Tofton, Norway with pretty mixed emotions and we picked up our rust bucket of a project truck. So to celebrate Project Thor's first anniversary, and thank you guys for all the likes, comments, and subscribes, we thought we'd do a little something different today and pay tribute to the history of the Geländewagen, as it's called in German. And we split this up into four parts to cover essentially what are four different model series within the G-Wagon family. And since our Thor is a W460, and because it was the first G in history, We'll start with that. So without further ado, let's get into part one. The story of the Geländewagen, which means something like all-terrain vehicle in German, or G-Model for short, goes all the way back to the early 1970s. Roller skates and bell bottoms were all the rage, Marlon Brando refused an Oscar for his role as the Godfather, and people listened to Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, and the Bee Gees using weird crab-shaped discs from, made from vinyl. But contrary to what you might expect, the story of the Geländewagen begins not here in Germany, not even in Austria, but in Iran, with then ruler Shah Mohammed Reza Pahlavi. Now Mohammed here had a soft spot for exotic European sports cars, and with oil prices climbing to ever new heights throughout the 60s, he had to spare Mullah to assemble quite the collection of Mercedes, Maseratis, Porsches, and a boatload of Ferraris. But the Shah had a problem. He was also an avid hunter and none of his European luxury cars were any good getting into falconry events in the desert. And driving out there in a raggedy old Willys Jeep, getting sand blown in your face, well that was simply unacceptable for the show. I mean look at this outfit, this man likes to ride in style. Now luckily for him, the Shah owned 18% of a stock in a little German car maker called Daimler Benz. So he took his idea of a rugged, capable, yet luxurious vehicle that would turn heads in the desert and in front of the palace in Tehran to the board of Daimler. And they thought it was the dumbest idea they had ever heard. They just couldn't imagine anyone but the Shah would want to buy a vehicle like this. The Shah, however, owned 18% of the stock, so they couldn't exactly to tell him to F off. So eventually they thought of the West German army, the Bundeswehr, and a couple of other nation armed forces as potential other buyers. And in 1972, reluctantly agreed to give the project a chance. To do that, Daimler called on a joint venture they had going on in the city of Steyr in Austria called Steyr Daimler Puch, which sounds like much less silly of a name in, in German than it does in English. This joint venture had been going since the 1930s and had since 1959 successfully manufactured and marketed a very utilitarian all-terrain vehicle, the Haflinger, named after a very venerable breed of workhorse in the Austrian Alps, mostly to military customers. So they were the logical people to entrust with this new project. And boy did the Steyr engineers rise to the occasion. They came up with a ridiculous list of capabilities and features this new vehicle was supposed to have. First of all, of course, it was supposed to be able to traverse the toughest of terrains. So to do that, they decided to give it a stiff box ladder frame with plenty of cross members, solid axles with high ground clearance, coil springs for better articulation at a time when almost all heavier vehicles still feature leaf springs, a transfer case with selectable two high, four high and four low gears, and lockable front and rear differentials, an absolute first for a passenger vehicle. They designed this truck, get this, they designed this truck to be able to lean over 40% before it tips. 
It also was supposed to be able to comfortably handle heavy loads, so it would need a, a torquey strong engine and strong brakes. So they decided to switch the drum brakes in the front for the recently developed disc brakes. And finally, it was supposed to be comfortable. So the ride would need to be very smooth, and they would need to come up with a way to switch from two-wheel drive into four-wheel drive, ideally without having to get out of your seat. In 1973, they presented the board of Daimler with the first wooden model of what became the Geländewagen. With the first drivable prototype beginning various testing in environments such as German coal fields, the Sahara Desert and the Arctic Circle in 1974. Because the Arctic Circle is a bit of a drive though from Austria, the engineers at Steyr also designed a test track on a mountain near Graz to be able to test components in real world conditions. The test track is still in use for development of the G-Wagon today and its name has become synonymous with the G-Wagon brand. I am of course talking about the Schöckel. In February of 1977, Daimler-Benz and Steyr Daimler Puch formed another joint venture called Geländefahrzeuggesellschaft mit beschränkter Haftung, or GFG for short, to handle production of a new vehicle. And finally, in early 1979, just as Shah Pahlavi was kicked off the throne and chased out of the country amidst the Islamic revolution, the G-Wagon entered serial production in Graz, with assembly up to this day being done largely by hand. The first model series of the G-Wagon bore the internal model code W460. And if you have any idea what the logic behind this code is, please let us know in the comments section. We haven't been able to figure that out yet. Now, starting in 1979, you could order your 460 in three different body styles. Short wheelbase convertible, short wheelbase station wagon, and long wheelbase station wagon. These were accompanied by a choice of two gas and two diesel engines. Now, in the gasoline camp, the sort of bread and butter choice came as the 230 GE with a 2.3 liter inline four. First, the M115 with 102 horsepower, which was replaced in 1982 with the M102, putting out 125 horsepower. And those who could spare the extra change went for the 230's bigger brother, the 280 GE, that came with a 2.8 liter M110 inline six, putting out a comfortable 150 horsepower, usually made it to a four-speed automatic transmission. And in 1983, Belgian race car driver Jackie Ikes put the automotive world on notice about the potential of this new truck by taking first in the legendary Paris-Dakar rally in a 230 GE that had been modified to put out 220 horsepower. Now in the diesel camp, your choice was between the 2.4 liter OM1616, damn. The 2.4 liter OM616, an inline four, putting out a whopping 72 horsepower in the 240 GD, and the 88 horsepower three liter OM617 that came in the 300 GD. Now the story with the OM617, which is the engine we have in Thor, is kind of interesting too, because in essence, it is just the OM616 with an extra cylinder strapped to the end of the block. I'm serious. Mercedes used the OM16 engine in various other models at the time, and they realized that 72 horsepower just wasn't powerful enough for traffic conditions and most people's expectations for sufficient engine power at the time. But they weren't prepared to spend the money to come up with a brand new design for a more powerful engine from scratch. So they decided to play it safe and simply increase displacement by adding an extra cylinder to the proven design. And voila, we got the OM617. A trick that seems to have worked because the naturally aspirated three liter that put out a mind boggling 172 newton meters of torque quickly became the best selling engine option for the W460 and a popular choice in many other Mercedes models as well. Now in 1987, the smaller OM616 was replaced with the OM602, also an inline four, but a completely new design, now putting out a mind boggling 84 horsepower. And by the way, the letter M in these Mercedes engine denominations simply stands for motor and is used for all gasoline engines, while OM stands for oil motor and is used for models powered by light oil, AKA diesel. 
Now with the W460 starting to show this is Lasse's part. With the W460 starting to show commercial success in 1981, Daimler-Benz dissolved the joint venture GFG and took over research and development on the G model and would henceforth be listed as the manufacturer in paperwork for new vehicles, while Steyr Puch would focus on the production of the truck. That new agreement also allowed Steyr Puch to market and sell G-Wagon in certain markets through their own distribution network as the Puch G. These were sold mostly in Austria, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, former Yugoslavia and parts of Africa and make up about 10% of all G-Wagons sold at the time, though some were later fitted with the Mercedes badges and are hard to spot. They continued to improve the design throughout the 80s, with the first automatic transmission option, air conditioning, an auxiliary fuel tank, protective headlamp grills and a cable winch, all coming available in 1981. Fuel injection became available in 1982, when the 230 GE was introduced in Turin, along with more comfortable and supportive front seats, wider tires and fender flares. Later differential locks, central door locking and a tachometer became standard and by 1986 over 50,000 G models had been produced. Now because Mercedes was worried about tarnishing its reputation as a luxury car maker, their util ah, utilitarian utilitarian the utilitarian the utilitarian farm truck with 72 horsepower was never officially exported to the united states tightening regulation in the form of the motor vehicle safety compliance act made importing very difficult at the time of production and even though they can now be imported much more easily as a historic vehicle only few double 460s can be found in the us that was all to change with later models of course which we will get to in the next episode. Now, a relative failure compared to expectations was the sale of the W460 to military customers. The deal to supply the German Bundeswehr fell through, with the Bundeswehr deciding to save the budget and stick with their tried and true Kübelwagen for a few more years. Only the French army actually showed some interest, but being French, obviously they couldn't bear the thought of their army driving around in a German truck. So get this. In 1981, they struck a deal with Daimler to only buy partially assembled W460s and fit them with axles, a transmission and a diesel engine manufactured by Peugeot. And they called it the Peugeot P4 VLTT, which stands for Voiture Légère Tout Terrain. I hope I pronounced that correctly. There are two special W460s that are now at the Mercedes-Benz Museum in Stuttgart. The first one was outfitted with a clear thermoplastic top and served the Vatican as the official Pope mobile in the 1980s. The other one is Otto. Otto is a 1988 300 GD just like our Thor and Otto was bought brand new off the showroom floor by this guy, Gunther Holtorf. Now Gunther was a retired airline pilot who had just turned 50 had been divorced by a second wife and like all airline pilots at age 50 was deeply embedded in a midlife crisis. But rather than get a tattoo and a Harley Davidson, Gunther decided to buy Otto and set out on what ended up being a 26 year journey through 215 countries. Now already being well traveled at the time and knowing road conditions around the world, he later told the story of being somewhat skeptical of the marketing slogan Mercedes used for the G-Wagon at the time where there is a G, there is a way. But Otto, who is still in original condition today, a bone stock truck, proceeded to start every morning on the first try, got Gunther to where he was going without ever breaking a sweat, and that way earned his trust on what ended up being a 899,000 kilometer journey. A truly remarkable story that you can learn more about in the comment section. Which wraps up this first episode of the history of the Geländewagen. Wagen. Geländewagen. On the history of the Geländewagen, where we covered the model series W460, which ran from 1979 until 1992. Thank you so much for watching. This was a very time consuming video to make. So if you enjoyed it, please give a thumbs up below. In the next episode, we will look at what fundamental changes the 90s brought to the G Wagon 
and how it went from a niche off-roader to a worldwide automobile icon. Don't forget to hit the little notification bell next to the subscribe button so you don't miss it. Until then, take care.